Concrete Day is always a mixture of anxiety and excitement. Try to minimize the anxiety and get the best slab foundation that you possibly can. I'm gonna walk you through our concrete day and explain what's happening, the tools we're using, and let you in on a few critical details that will hopefully help you succeed on your project. What's up y'all, Logan Parker, Airland Builders, welcome back. Today's concrete day. There's nothing more exciting than getting your project out of the ground. And today is that day. We're pouring a monolithic slab foundation for an 8,000 square foot timber framed event center. By this point, you should have already completed your prep work. You've installed your wood or steel forms around the foundation perimeter. You've got your under slab plumbing and electrical installed and inspected. You've got your gravel, vapor barrier, plastic sheeting, insulation, rebar, and any floor drains and radon gas vents piped. But chances are you still got a few loose ends to tie up. For instance, I'm adding a copper ground wire that ties into all the steel reinforcement embedded in the concrete. We've got a lot of bedrock around this site and probably won't be able to drive ground rods a full eight feet deep. So having that extra grounding force will help big time. The crew started about 30 minutes ahead of schedule this morning, and so I was scrambling to get my ground wire in before it was too late. Fortunately, we poured the concrete footings first with a stiffer concrete mix so that it would support its own weight a little better and not put so much force on the steel formwork going around the perimeter in which case I was able to feed the number eight ground wire down through the concrete footing mix and out underneath the form to connect to the future electrical panel and ground rods. The next load going down is a wetter four and a half inch slump that's gonna be much easier to spread around and trowel finish. If I'd have been 30 minutes later, I wouldn't have been able to get that U for ground wire in. So get there early. Concrete crews like to start at the crack of dawn. One, so they can beat the heat. Secondly, so they can get done in one day, regardless of how long it takes for the concrete to set up and finish. They ain't waiting around for you, and they're probably not privy to your last minute details. Concrete, obviously, the first thing you need is concrete. Make sure you know how to calculate how much concrete you need and reserve it well in advance. Concrete is measured in cubic yards. A yard is three feet long by three feet wide by three feet high. That's 27 cubic feet. For example, a four inch thick slab that is 27 feet wide by 30 feet long is 810 square feet. To get the volume of a four inch thick slab, divide the square footage by three since four inches is one third of 12 inch or one foot. 810 in this instance divided by three equals 270 cubic feet. Divide 270 cubic feet divided by 27 cubic feet per yard and you get 10 yards. It gets a little tricky in the turndown footing of a monolithic slab. You'll need to measure the cross section below the slab floor height and multiply by the lineal feet of the footing to get the cubic feet. With a shallow footing, we typically see about two cubic feet per lineal foot of turndown footing on a monolithic slab with a 12 inch deep footing. If you're up north and you have a much deeper footing for frost heave, it's obviously gonna be a lot more. Don't forget to add up the material you'll need for thickened footers where there's point loads from the future framing above. All right, a pump truck, if you have the space on site, is awesome to have. My buddy used to always say, don't hump it, pump it. Most small jobs, you probably won't need a pump truck. 
but on larger projects where there's more than 30 yards of concrete or access is limited, you don't want to wear yourself out moving hundreds of pounds of concrete in a wheelbarrow. You need to save that time and energy for finishing the concrete. A pump truck usually costs about $175 an hour on top of the concrete material costs, so it better be worthwhile. And it usually is. They can deliver concrete exactly where you need it. Just be careful because that concrete comes out with some major force and can destroy your formwork if it's not braced well. Mud boots. This almost goes without saying, but it's worth mentioning. This is something that everyone needs. Concrete will ruin a pair of shoes or leather work boots. Make sure you wear boots that are slick and wash off easily. Gloves. Concrete is caustic, so you want to protect your skin if you're getting in there. Make sure you have a hammer. It's important to vibrate the exposed edges of concrete along your formwork to encourage the concrete to settle into the voids and give you a completely solid wall with no pockets or honeycombs. If you don't have a hammer, you can use a big fat stick or something in a pinch. Uh, you need a concrete rake, typically called a come along, and it's an invaluable tool. Everyone helping place concrete needs one. You can push and pull concrete easily and help get it flat at the same time as you rake it around from high spots to low spots. It also has a hook on one side that can be used to pick up the reinforcement wire so that it's properly suspended within the top one inch of concrete. You can also use a pickmatic or other hook to pull up the wire, which is a good idea if you're pumping concrete and need to pick up large areas of wire at a time when the concrete was flowing fast. A mag trowel is a critical tool that almost everyone should have as well. It's a stiff magnesium float that pushes down gravel and brings the creamy cement and sand slurry mix to the top to get a buttery smooth surface that's easy to finish. We always finish the perimeter edges with a mag trowel first so they're ready to screed off. The mag trowel also comes in handy around pipes and penetrations. The laser level is one of the greatest inventions of all time. This one is a battery powered rotary laser that spins in a circle constantly. Once you take your receiver and mount it on the Stadia stick at the relative height of the top of the foundation form, all you have to do is place some concrete and build it up or knock it down until the laser beeps to tell you it's level. Then you've got a point in the middle of the slab that you know is level to your formwork. You'll see we're using a screed here. It's an aluminum screed. Um, you can use a wood screed also. It's a straight board. A screed is a straight board that flattens concrete in between two known level points. Most of the time, you'll see two people using a screed, one person on each end. Use a sawing motion as you drag the screed to help the concrete settle flat and work its way through the thick concrete. Here, we're screeding between the edge of the foundation, on the top of the form, and out to a point in the middle of the slab that we established level with the transit. If your slab is less than 16 feet wide, you can simply make a screed long enough to ride on top of the foundation formwork and flatten out the concrete in one simple pass. Short screeds, eight feet or less, can be made of wood, like a two by four. Longer screeds are difficult to pull through concrete and need to be rigid aluminum. Here's a quick tip. If you're using a wooden screed, make sure it's either straight or slightly bowed up so that the water drains off of the slab instead of pooling on top of the concrete once the concrete is cured. I love tools that simplify the process, and this is one of them. The vibrating screed is a tool that will save you a ton of time and energy kneeling down in the concrete with a regular wood or aluminum screed. Place it on two known points or screed lines that are level and screed off all the high stuff in between. You'll need someone raking out the excess and filling in low spots as you move across an area with a vibrating screed. A bull float is also an essential tool. One man can use this tool to start the rough finishing process. 
The bull float is a thick and rigid magnesium float that effectively pushes down the rock aggregate beneath the surface and brings the creamy cement and sand slurry to the surface, making it easy to get a slick finish. The leading edge rides above the surface, letting the back edge do the work. By twisting the pole handle to the left or right, the float head pivots so that you can drag it back without digging into the concrete. Genius. The edger is a hand tool that you run along the perimeter of your foundation wall to create a smooth roundover. It creates a roundover edge that looks really good and won't chip off like a sharp squared up corner after the formwork is removed. You don't need to do this on areas where there's a wall covering or protecting that edge, but on open patios and porches, you definitely want to round over that hard edge. Run the edger after the slab is rough finished with the bull float. And don't wait too long or you'll be pulling up rock aggregate and be difficult to get a smooth round over. Finishing trowels are the thin metal trowels that are flexible and allow you to get a really smooth finish once the concrete has set up and feels like wet putty. Rounded trowels are the easiest to use without nicking the concrete surface like you would with a sharp corner of a square edge trowel. Um, the flexible trowels are going to let you do that nice fine detail work around pipes and penetrations and eventually along the edge where your finishing machines can't reach. The finishing machine. Power trowels are a critical tool on a large slab foundation. They come in all sizes, small and large walk behind and even ride-on finishers. The smaller walk-behind machines are great for finishing edges and tight spaces around pipes and other penetrations. The ride-on finishers are heavy, which means you need a loader to even get it on the slab, but it makes the best finish and can work three to four times as fast as a walk-behind machine. They really make a nice, smooth finish and are a critical tool if you're finishing more than 4,000 square feet of slab in one day. All right, you'll need a tape measure and a chalk line, things you probably already have, but don't forget to bring them. You need that to measure and snap your lines for control joints. If you're embedding hold down bolts in the wet concrete, you'll also need a tape measure to locate where those will be too. A control joint saw. Two things are guaranteed with concrete. It will get hard and eventually it will crack. Control joints are a one inch deep cut in the slab floor that encourage those cracks to happen where you want them. Most people hide them underneath interior walls and cut lines where they'll look attractive. But sometimes a pattern in the open floor is nice too. With control joints, the idea is that concrete will crack at its weakest point, which is typically where it's thinnest. Scoring the concrete one inch deep creates the weak points and encourages cracks to develop underneath those straight lines. You end up with a less lightning pattern cracking and more decorative lines or pattern cuts. The American Concrete Institute recommends spacing control joints no more than three times the thickness in feet. Here we have a four inch thick slab, so when we multiply four inches times three, we get a control joint spacing of 12 feet. Keep in mind that's a maximum. Tighter spacing is better than wider spacing. So to recap, you want to start early. Manpower. Make sure you've got machines and enough skilled labor on site to help you get the job done. You don't want a bunch of rookies out there learning on your slab. Um, you want a screed and a way to level on any job. You need a mag trowel to push down the aggregate along the edges so that you have something nice to finish up against with your bull float, your, your vibrating screed, and your finishing machine. That's a wrap, y'all. I hope you learned something new today. If so, smash that like button and make sure to subscribe to our channel. We're going to be following this whole project and showing you all the tips and tricks along the way. As always, y'all, thanks for watching. Until the next one, peace out.